What if there were a cheap and easy way to get faster performance, more storage capacity, and even data protection all in one simple free solution? There is, and it's called RAID. I'll tell you what it is, how it works, and how you set it up. All today in Dave's Garage. That's how much I love this episode. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today, we're going to look at one of my favorite operating system features, RAID. Everyone's heard of it, but what does it do and how does it do it? Well, if one disk is good, then two is better than one, right? And by that logic, if two drives is good, then four would be even better yet. Well, that's what I said, and so that's why I built a little four-disk unit, naturally called Lil Nas for Little Network Attached Storage. But if four drives are good, then 12 would be great, right? Well, that's what I said too, and so that's why I built this 12 base Synology NAS so that I had somewhere to back up my little NAS too. And in theory, if 12 disks is great, then you've got to assume that 24 would be twice as great. And so that's why I built this 24 base Super Micro NAS to back up my 12 bay NAS too. And of course, if 24 drives is great, then it stands to reason that even more would be even better yet. And that's why I just built this 30 drive, 420 terabyte monstrosity of a Storinator based on the Q30 model from 45 Drives Corporation. And if I ever do outgrow it, they also make 45 and 60 drive chassis. Now, most folks know that RAID groups some number of smaller hard drives together to make one big one somehow, and they can also be made fault tolerant in some way, whatever that really means. So let's dive right on in and see how RAID actually works and what benefits it provides because it's a lot cooler than just getting more storage space. RAID originally stood for Redundant Array of Inexpensive Disks. The inexpensive part became independent at some point, and with the advent of solid state storage, the D became drives instead of just disks. Thus, today we have Redundant Array of Independent Drives, but everyone still just knows it as RAID. Let's start with a simple case of a single disk. A traditional disk like this 14 terabyte Seagate Exos drive has 14 heads inside, one for each side of the seven platters. Each platter is then broken down into a series of tracks, and those tracks are divvied up into sectors. Now, back in my MS DOS days, you might have had to worry about knowing the actual number of tracks and sectors and so on, but not today. Drives are reasonably intelligent on their own now, and they present themselves as a sequential series of addressable blocks. The fact that you're reading and writing from up to 14 heads at once is completely hidden from the user and even transparent to the operating system itself. Oh yes, my wonderful friends, you're just in time to find out the answer to a very interesting question. Which is how many heads does the X16 disk drive actually have? You see, Dave has said many different things in this episode, so let's ask the big organ. 14, 15. heads at once is completely hidden from the user and even transparent to the operating system itself. Similarly, RAID is a way of taking multiple drives and extending that even further. With RAID at its very simplest, your hard drive volume can span multiple drives, and so if you had four 10 terabyte drives, you could make them appear as one big 40 terabyte drive. But that's actually the least interesting thing you can do with RAID. There's also another problem. What if one of those disks fails? Even with just two disks, you don't lose half your data, you lose it all. If every other block is missing from a program or a database, it's entirely corrupt. And the worst part is that by making one drive out of two, you've picked up twice the error rate and twice the number of things that could go wrong in general. And if you were to extend this to something like 10 disks, it would be madness because, again, if any one of those 10 disks fails, everything is gone. Clearly, that's not a safe or workable solution. What I just described to you could have been what's known as a JBOD for just a bunch of disks, or it could have been a stripe set. The difference is that with a stripe set, the system is smart enough to write a little bit of data, a stripe, to one drive, a little bit of the data to the next drive, and so on. By doing so, it can read and write at much higher speeds because it's reading and writing data at a constant rate, but to many more disks at once. Your sequential transfer rates, in theory, are almost additive. If each drive does 200 megabytes a second, and then 10 of them should do 2 gigabytes a second. This is true for reads as well, because when the system goes to fetch the data, it can read back a piece of it from each of the 10 drives at the same time, multiplying the effective speed. In my own system at home here, I have three SSDs striped in this manner, and I get some impressive speeds as a result. Let's take a quick look at the performance of that RAID set. 
Now remember, this is a Stripe set, which means it reads and writes data to and from each of the three SSDs at the same time. Each drive is capable of about 3,500 megabytes a second on its own, so in theory, I should be able to get nearly three times that. The drives are connected via PCI 4x16 interface, so the bandwidth is probably there. And sure enough, using Crystal Disk Mark, I'm able to benchmark the drives at more than 10 gigabytes a second. Remember, that's 10 gigabytes, not gigabits. All brought to you courtesy of RAID. But as noted, if it's a bad idea because it's so prone to data loss, then what's the point then? Well, that's where modern RAID really starts to shine. It does several clever things, the first of which is to offer drive mirroring. If you had two drives and instead of writing a piece of the data to each of the drives, what if you wrote everything to both drives? Now immediately you can see that this is going to consume a lot of space, in fact twice as much as normal. We're going to wind up with a volume whose size is the same as one of the drives, not both drives added together. But the data will be stored identically on both in case there's ever a problem. With mirroring, your write speeds would also be limited to the speed of being able to write to each drive, effectively, but your read speeds are multiplied, just as they would be with the Stripe set, because the system can read from all the drives at once. Now, rather than reading the same data from each drive, of course, it would read a portion of the file, or the data, from each drive, and then reassemble it in memory as a whole. But by reading from both at once, it can do so at up to twice the speed when there are two drives. A mirror can be made up of more than two drives, but two is the most common. If you wanted to invest the space, four drives would make the mirror faster and more immune to failure, but not actually any larger. If storage were free, we'd all mirror our data just to be safe, except it isn't, and so normally we don't. But my 45 drive server is built with a lot of redundancy and safety features, and one of them is that it mirrors the SSDs of the boot drive. In other words, it comes with two identical 250 or 500 gigabyte drives, whichever they're mirrored. They act as a single drive so that if either one fails, the system continues as normal. You get a notice in the console or an email comes to you and you replace the bad drive and it copies the data from the good drive back to the new drive for the next time that it potentially happens. It's a very reliable system, but such industrial strength measures aren't common in the desktop world, not least of which because people don't want to pay twice as much for their storage. Some NAS machines use mirrored SSDs for the write cache, giving a big boost in speed and helping to avoid the write hole, which is where data is lost before it makes its way all the way to the hard drives. With two SSDs, even if one fails, your data is still safe. Modern RAID offers a third alternative known as fault tolerance that gives you something that is quite close to being the best of both worlds. The most commonly used type of RAID that offers fault tolerance is known as RAID 5. Now, by being fault tolerant, I don't mean fault resistant. If you had a 10 drive RAID 5 volume, the odds of any one drive failing is still just as high as it would be if it were a stripe set. The difference is that RAID 5 can tolerate and recover from errors because it dedicates a portion of each drive to tracking parity information. For those that are new to parity and for those who have heard the term a million times but still don't know exactly what it means, here's all that parity is. You keep track of an extra bit for every byte that's being stored. That bit just keeps track of whether your 8-bit byte had an odd or an even number of bits set within it. That's it. That's all a parity bit is. If one of the bits in the byte changes, then the parity bit will be wrong and you'll know right away. We won't know which bit in the byte was bad, just that the byte itself is now bad. It's perfect. A complete lock. It's totally foolproof. Well, unless two bits go bad at once, I guess. But what are the odds of that happening? Here's a little tangent that fascinated me when I first learned of it back in school. As I said with parity, when a bit goes wrong, you know that it happened somewhere in that byte, but not where. Not which bit in the byte is actually wrong, so you can't fix it. But what if you stacked eight bytes into a list, assembled into a checkerboard style arrangement, and then kept parity bits for both the rows and the columns? As long as just a single bit went wrong, you'd know exactly which row and column, and thus precisely which one was wrong. And that's the essence of error correcting Hamming code, as invented by Richard Hamming back in like the 1940s at Bell Labs. And now we know exactly how ECC memory works. Of course, the grid doesn't need to be 8x8. Its size and dimensions can be tuned to best suit your problem space, such as how often errors occur in your data. But a bit per byte is actually pretty common. Now back to RAID 5, you might be thinking, well, that's all good and well when one bit at a time goes bad, perhaps. But what good is parity going to do me when there's a head crash or an entire drive dies? And that's the beauty of the way that RAID parity is calculated and stored. It means that if the errors are limited to a single drive, it doesn't matter how catastrophic they are to that drive. As in, pull the drive out, walk away, and drill a hole through it and throw it in your dumpster. Yet your data is still fine. You then put in a new drive, and the RAID system will normally start rebuilding the missing data from the parity information that it still has on the remaining drives. 
Because of the size, that process can take hours or days for large RAID volumes, but as long as a second drive does not fail before the rebuild process is completed, no data is lost. RAID 5 can also read and write to multiple drives at the same time, providing a significant performance boost, though both calculating and storing the parity information isn't free, so the gains are not as linear as natively striping the drive would be. If that doesn't sound like enough protection because you're worried about that scenario of what if a second drive fails in the meantime, there are two steps you can take with RAID. The first is to install an extra drive in the machine and allocate it as what's known as a hot spare. It just sits there in the machine doing nothing until a drive fails in the RAID set, and then the failed drive is immediately replaced, logically of course, in the set by the hot spare. That way, the rebuilding process can start immediately rather than relying on an operator or you to A, notice the problem, and B, swap it out for a good drive. It speeds up the process significantly, and it shortens that RAID 5 window where you could lose everything due to a second drive failing, but it does not eliminate it. Your next option is to move to RAID 6, which is very much like RAID 5, except it keeps even more and better parity information. In so doing, up to two drives can fail at any one time, and the system will be able to recover without losing so much as a single byte. In the unlikely event that a third drive fails, everything is gone. But that's very unlikely outside of human error or negligence, particularly if hot spares are also allocated to the array. These techniques can also be combined. For example, you could make a stripe set of four drives, which would be very fast, but pretty risky. You could then mirror that set of drives to another four drive stripe set, and so that you had two stripe sets that are mirrors of each other. This is known as RAID 0 plus 1, a somewhat clumsy name that makes more sense when you realize that RAID 0 and then RAID 1, or first you create the stripe set, and then you mirror those stripe sets. It's much better to do it the other way, RAID 1 plus 0, also sometimes shortened to RAID 10. It's the same number of drives, but a very different layout. RAID 10 is a stripe set of mirrors, and while you only get half of your raw capacity, it's perhaps the best method. RAID 10 combines the fault tolerance of RAID 1 and the speed of RAID 0. It offers the best throughput and the lowest latency of all the RAID levels other than simply striping the data naively, and it does it with relative safety because all the data is mirrored. Notice how I said relative safety? Why the weasel word? Well, it's because it's safer, but it's not safe. RAID is not a backup because you can't assume that you'll never have two or three drives fail, particularly in a larger setup. Furthermore, drive failures are just one way that you can lose data. Just ask anyone who's done a recursive delete from the wrong folder. Whoops. No amount of fancy parity can save you from yourself, and backups are still a necessity even with RAID. And yet, given the number of people that own a single NAS box with nowhere to back it up to, it seems like the admonition that RAID isn't a backup is still lost on most folks, as though they're teenagers listening to and humoring their parents. That's because their parents have lost data before, that's why. Now, a good rule of thumb is to have three copies in at least two locations, ideally in different formats, and to have actually tested your backups by going through the process of restoring them. The script for this episode alone, for example, lives on my MacBook SSD. It also lives on OneDrive, so there's a copy in the cloud. It's stored in an automatic time machine every night up on a RAID 6 NAS. The data from the NAS is backed up to a second NAS at a separate physical location every night, and so the file will exist in three to four locations on three different types of media. That's how much I love this episode. I just don't want to lose it. And yet, with all that, I still lose things occasionally. That's it for the theory. Let's jump right into a RAID system and I'll show you how to create a stripe set, a mirror, and fault tolerant volumes. I'll even try to set up a 10 disk RAID 1 plus 0 pool for good measure. Just as hard drives have their own terminology like platters and heads and tracks and sectors, RAID has a few of its own. Before we get started then, here's the big picture. We're going to arrange hard drives by grouping them into what's called a storage pool. We'll then create a file system volume within that pool, which is where your files and folders would live and then we'll share that volume on the network. That's the basics. While we could do everything that we're about to do from the Linux command line, or even ostensibly inside the Windows Disk Manager, we're going to use the friendly user interface that was supplied with my server from 45 drives, known as the Houston Control Center. Now, in a previous video, I referred to it as proprietary, but that was a slip, as I should have said custom. Houston adds the ability to do most everything you want to do with a storage server through a simple and easy-to-navigate UI. In addition to providing direct control and monitoring of your hardware, Houston provides the ability to work with ZFS, the advanced storage system available under Linux. Let's have a look. I can access Houston with a web browser by going to port 9090 of the machine where it's been installed. Once I'm there, the first thing I'm going to do is to create a stripe set. Keep in mind that within Houston, making a stripe set out of multiple disks really is just making a bigger disk from many smaller disks, so you're creating what Houston also refers to as a disk. 
In other words, you're aggregating smaller physical disks into a bigger logical disk. I'll name it Stripe Set and then select five of the drives that I plan to add. I can expand the pool drop down and then click on the status tab where I can see the five drives that make up my new Stripe Set. Each drive in this case is 10 gigabytes in this demo setup, giving me close to 50 gigabytes in the resultant Stripe Set, which is what we'd expect when the data is spread across all five drives. That's RAID 0. To look at RAID 1 next, I'll create a mirror. This is as easy as selecting the mirror option from the drop down in the Houston UI. Next, I'll select five drives that I plan to become my mirror set. We can see that since the same data will be written to every drive, we wind up with only approaching about 10 gigabytes, which is the capacity of each of the single drives. So this will be quite wasteful of space, but very fault tolerant and very fast for reads. Now that we've successfully created a stripe set and a mirror, the basics, let's move on to creating a fault tolerant volume with parity. To do this, I simply create a new pool, add the drives I want to be part of it, and pick ZFS2. Now this is a bit confusing, no doubt, because the names have changed. ZFS calls what is essentially RAID 5 by the name ZFS2, whereas RAID 6 is called ZFS3. The essential part to know is that like RAID 5, ZFS2 can lose one drive, and ZFS3, like RAID 6, can lose two drives before data loss is inevitable. I'm going to create a pool called Lil RAID and use ZFS2, and I'm going to add 10 drives to it. Even with the overhead of ZFS2's parity, I'm still met with the resulting 95 of my 107 raw terabytes. I have one drive left available, and I'm going to add it as a hot spare. To do that, I pick existing array, and then I add virtual device, where I can add a new VDEV. I pick spare from the drop-down list to indicate that I'm adding a hot spare, and I specify my one remaining drive. It now appears at the bottom of the list of hard drives in a new section. Having a storage pool is necessary, but not sufficient. We need to create a file system volume on top of that. Think of the storage pool as a monster partition, and then we have to format it. To do that, I select Create File System. I'll give it a name of Lil Raid FS so I can figure out where it is, and when I click Create, it should return promptly with a new file system created and listed in the UI. You could just use this file system mounted locally at this point, but odds are you want to share it on the network to make use of it from other machines. To do so, I'm first going to set the permissions on the file system so that my account can see it on the network, and then I'm going to share it using SMB. SMB is the way to go for almost all situations now because it's standard on both the Mac and the PC. It could also be set up using NFS, assuming you were able to configure your clients appropriately. This video might already be too long, and I still have yet to tell you how I wind up configuring my own actual big raid. Since I don't have time to show you everything that the Houston Control Center can do, I encourage you to check out the tutorials from 45 Drives on YouTube for more information. I installed Houston on top of a plain vanilla Ubuntu server within about three minutes, so it's easy to conveniently experiment with, and even doing it in a virtual machine is easy. It comes as a standard interface on all 45 drives machines, pre-configured and ready to go. And because they support hardware monitoring, you can drill down and inspect things like your PCI bus and memory slots right from the web browser. Now, for my own machine, here's the configuration I went with. I have 30 drives now, each 14 terabytes each, for a total of 420 terabytes of raw capacity. I broke that up into three VDEVs of nine drives each, striped with ZFS3. Simple math tells you that I have three drives left over, and I assigned them as hot spares that can flexibly be applied to any of the pools. Hot spares aren't dedicated to any particular VDEV. They can dynamically replace any drive in the pool that fails. The only case where I would lose data would be if I lost three of any particular group of nine drives before the hot spare could substitute in and be rebuilt. On the other hand, I could lose two drives from each VDEV as well as all three hot spares, so in theory, I could lose nine drives before I lost data. That case isn't likely, of course, but it's possible. As I'm fond of saying, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. And probably the biggest thing you could do to help the channel is to share an episode with a like-minded friend that might not be aware of the channel. Heck, share it for the blowtorch intro alone. There should be a share button right below. By now, the odds are that you've heard me read my ad for my book, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire, so many times that you can recite this part of the video by heart, so I will spare you today. But remember, there's a lot of info in that book that's useful for people who aren't on the spectrum themselves, but who live, love, or work with somebody who is. If that could be you, check out the book on Amazon. Thanks for joining me here in the shop today. Here's a reminder to check the video description for a live stream information, and in the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time right here in Dave's Garage.